Good morning, everyone. This is Carpo, coming at you from my cold garage. So, I'm sitting out here with some of my uh, literature and my books and my articles and studies and di different things. Got my Manly Hall book here, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And uh, I flipped open to a random page the other day. It was actually yesterday. Yesterday afternoon, I just grabbed the book and I flipped open randomly to a page and it was, what was it here, 4, 412. And uh, <laughs> these pictures came up. These, you won't be able to see them all, but it's just a bunch of little diagrams from some old Kabbalistic drawings. These are from the um, Hermetica. I'm pretty sure that those are from the book itself. But anyway, it just so happened that the previous evening, uh, I had been looking up some old literature, some of the old, uh, I can't remember, the, uh, the Mago. It's a particular book, the Cabo, Mago Cabo. It's an old Kabbalistic uh, type, well, <laughs> It's an alchemical book, if you will. Okay, it's and and the idea of the uh, many of these practices were tied into alchemy, uh, mental and physical. But without getting too far into the alchemical part, uh, I looked at all the diagrams and pictures from a particular uh, book in the back, and they were all the exact same diagrams that I flipped to randomly there. It was just an interesting coincidence. I just thought I'd share, but. It kind of ties into what I'm trying to get across here, which is that we, as seekers, those of us who are seeking knowledge, tend to run across, uh, how do I put it metaphorically, it's kind of complicated to explain. It's like when it rains it pours, you know, you tend to run across a lot of knowledge at once, and uh, you might trip over one thing and find like, fall flat on your face and, and see everything laid out right in front of you. It's, uh, I'm, I, I'm having a harder time as I get older trying to describe some of the things that are in my head because instead of seeing them as like ideas or words, I see them as metaphors and ideas. And I start to see the inner circles and the inner workings within things and how everything is just spirals outward and then into the ether and back into the reality and how these cycles repeat and repeat and repeat on larger and larger scales the macro and micro and, <clears throat> and when I say that it just sounds cheesy because I can't express it like to someone if if I were to try to tell myself some of these things 20 years ago I'd just say what are you talking about you know you're you're you know <laughs> you're deluding yourself or you're you know I guess what it is is I wouldn't be able to understand where I was coming from but now that I understand my own thought patterns and thought processes, I see that the thinking and metaphors is a really important part of discovery to realize these things because you're able to see repeating patterns that happen with animals, that can happen with man, that can happen in your daily life or just in a lifetime. So when I flip to these pictures, um, these are actually diagrams of ideas. They're, they're further extending the idea of taking stories or inherited knowledge or wisdom that we have and going a step further from putting it into a metaphor and putting that metaphor into an actual diagram and that's one of the most complex things is that these these philosophers would sit around and draw these crazy complex shapes and uh, I, I guess I should give you in, uh, in case you're not into these kinds of things or haven't researched much um, you the Rosicrucians and you know the Here's the Dante's Divine Comedy, okay? Now, that, that looks like a bunch of just layers and circles. You know, it is. Um, understanding the hand, you know, and how all these symbols and these old paintings, they all have very, very deep, deep, deep meanings in them. I mean, <coughs> the idea was to learn how to tell an entire story in one picture, you know? You can have 
all the disciples, the idea of wisdom, ascension towards something greater. I, I mean, I, I can't sit here and explain these because I, it would make me look like an idiot because I've heard people try to explain them to me. And that's when I realized that you either get it or you don't. If you don't understand the picture, nobody can teach it to you. They can tell you what it means, but you have to understand the, the depth of it. And I don't. I'm not saying that I do. That's what I'm working on in my life. Um, as I grow and I, and I become more aware of the truths of life, <laughs> at least as I see them, I find that these pictures become more and more prominent you start to see symbols and this is a point where I want to say be careful not to let yourself get caught up with the details you can see symbols and you can get uh, you can understand the meaning behind it but let's just say for example just take an emblem from any <coughs> um, corporation or something and let's say that they have a triangle in their the name <coughs> many people will say that um, that they're using this symbology in order to sell to people at the subconscious level and many times this might be true many large companies understand that symbols do work magic on people's peripheral consciousness or subconscious but often and this is where because i was trying to explain this to someone yesterday sometimes these um, businesses companies or groups that use symbols don't do it necessarily out of the knowledge that that symbol is going to work on a person's subconscious but rather the person who invented the symbol let's say for the company was working from their subconscious when they did so for example let's think up a I'm gonna think up a logo for my business and uh, you could draw out you know any amount of shapes and it's going to associate or you know compare to something in the you know somebody's gonna be able to find something in it that says this is what it means but another person may find something completely different. So, kind of a long-winded way of saying that we all see pictures differently and we all get different things out of them and we have to realize that it's going to be the same way with all texts, all books. Take the Bible, for instance. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of people who take the Bible literally word for word. It's always been a very difficult thing for me to understand because they cherry pick what they want. Um, not everyone, and I'm not generalizing here because many people understand that the Bible has great words of wisdom. Some people take it with a grain of salt and say, well, it's just a guide and all the symbols are there, but it's not really about Jesus himself or not really about, um, you know, that the words aren't literal, that they're, they're meant to be interpreted and understood metaphorically. Then there are people who take it verbatim, literally, that God said this, that slaves shall obey their masters, that, um, uh, you know, you will burn in hell for this or this or this, and, and that this is a sin and this isn't a sin, and it's because having direction to life makes it much easier to live for a lot of people. Uh, I am a seeker of truth and I can't fight that. I therefore I can't be a follower. Now I'm not going to. I, I want to make a really important point here that that I don't know if I'm going to be able to word it correctly to where I'm not <laughs> sounding harsh. There are followers and there are leaders in this world. If you look at the animal kingdom and you look at the structure and the hierarchy, let's say with wolves, goats, any animal. The males that are, aren't quite there yet, let's say, the ones that aren't tough enough, I mean, they don't even put up a fight half the time. Uh, they won't fight the big guys to try to be dominant male because they know they'll lose. Sometimes they take a chance, and they do, and sometimes they win. And in human world, it's the same way. Sometimes we want to dominate something, but we know that we're just not alpha. Sometimes we try and do it anyway, and we end up conquering. Humans, following the same pattern as animals, have the same results, the only difference is that we have a consciousness which gets in the way. This is a difficult thing for me to understand how human consciousness is actually interfering with our process on Earth, yet it is our process on Earth. <clears throat> in other words, if we didn't have a conscious awareness, we would merely just be another animal. There would be no conscious will to change the planet to, to I guess, move forward. In other words, nature evolving by itself, not being self-aware, or maybe being self-aware, but no, the components of the animals not being uh, aware, as we consider aware. Um, 
it makes, I don't know, it makes for not a very exciting place to be because there's nobody to observe it. In other words, the observer is the end, the end goal, I guess, maybe, of the universe to create and evolve to the point where we can finally observe the universe being part of it and say, I am part of God, I am part of the universe, part of awareness, and here I am as an individual. This brief interlude, this little spark of awareness in history. And it's such a scary prospect that we've created religions to explain what happens afterwards and beforehand, just like we've used many scientific theories to explain away things like, well, it must be dark matter and dark energy that make up 96% of the universe. It's got to be there. We can see it in math, but we can't see it on paper. So we trust. We have faith that dark matter exists, or at least many people do. For me personally, I believe it to be anti-gravity, a completely separate matter that's all entwined with everything. But uh, my point here isn't really what's whether it's real or not, or, or uh, anything about space, but rather to see that when we want to understand something, we, we attribute and attach an idea to it, or we create a solution. We're very sure of ourselves when we want to be, and we're, when we're feeling uncomfortable about something. So one of the most noble things we can do is just open our minds and hearts and be willing to change every day. For me, this has become difficult even because as much as aware as I thought I was, I'm still constantly each day finding myself arguing with somebody about something maybe that I might even agree with them on. And I ask myself, what am I trying to press here? I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm just trying to get the truth out. I guess what it is is I'm learning to find what moves people and why they believe the things they do so strongly. For example, I guess I could give you a political view. I'm totally opposed to Donald Trump. I think he's a complete buffoon. Um, <clears throat> but when I had a, dis a dispute or argument with somebody the other day who was fully supporting him to the point where they had his profile photo as theirs, um, instead of just saying you're a dumb fuck and you don't know shit, I asked them, what are these policies that he has that you want to understand or that you want to be put in implemented? And I got my answer, which was none. I, the person doesn't know what they were talking about. But we apply this to all daily things, all, or all confrontations we have with people, to say, what makes you believe this? Not to just dismiss them, but it's my responsibility to give a Christian respect and say, why do you believe what you believe? Just as they should give the respect to someone to say, why don't you believe? And only through these awarenesses and discussions can we actually come out with something. But we found that you can't write everything down on paper. It goes nowhere. All the papyrus was burned. The Library of Alexandria, the fear of discovery, and in future generations we might find our scientific evidence from today and destroy it, thinking it's, you know, heresy. <clears throat> towards whatever god or idea comes next. Meanwhile, the the truth seekers or the you know those who are seeking the mysteries will always remain. There will always be a small portion of society who just wants to know the truth, and um, at all costs. That means sometimes you have to be uncomfortable. That means sometimes you can't tell yourself, well, everything's going to be okay in the end. I'll be born into another body or that I'll go to heaven when I die and all these things. Sometimes we have to set aside the what ifs about after this life and ask ourselves, since we are here, what can we do to make it the best world possible while we're here? Sometimes it's like living a dream. You wake up from dreaming at night and it's so real and you think, you know, is this just another dream? But it doesn't matter. This conscious awareness that we wake up to each day is ours. We have to own it. We have to be it. We can't whine about the things that happen to us. We can't expect to have more than we have. We've just got to take charge and do it. We have full capabilities as humans to understand things, if we want to. But sometimes when we discover things, they're a little scarier than we thought they would be. Once you move past the scaredness <laughs> and realize that even the evil in this world is part of the whole, then the larger picture comes into view, and we realize that there are roles to play. There are leaders and followers. There are sheep. There are shepherds. There are wolves. 
There is not one way that everyone can be. There is no awareness that humanity can move towards, like I once thought that there was. There is no moment of waking up where the universe tells us all what we need to know one morning and we can start living properly because it just doesn't work. When you have somebody telling you what life is or what you should be doing, um, it defeats the whole purpose of free will. So the ultimate power lies in the fact that there is no specific direction that we have to go or that we're forced to go. And that options, having options that wide open is a scary proposition. It's easier to look at ancestors who may have been told you obey the, the word of the Lord and you tend to your crops and you tend to your children and, and you retire a happy man, die a happy man, and many people did. But there were always a few who just wasn't enough. And I'm one of those people who is just not enough. I can't believe what people tell me I, just because I want to. I can't believe what I read and cherry pick the parts that I want just because it's convenient and comfortable. And that's the life that I've chosen. And I'm sure that uh, other people have chosen the simple path. And I wanted to say that I honor that too. That I don't think all people should be seekers or, you know, looking for this knowledge because they can go and talk to someone who does and have to put a little trust into the person, but if a person doesn't have the time to do research on the mystery schools themselves, they can talk to someone who did. Just like the person who spends all their time researching mystery schools can go and talk to uh, a psychiatrist or a carpenter or a builder when they need help with something. These are parts that we play. These are roles that we play, and we don't all have to know all parts of it. No matter how much you think you know about the truth, it's all based on what other people have told